Great. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for inviting me to present on the, the Vatican work that we've been doing uh, between Rome and Stanford over the last four years. Uh, I'm going to talk in a couple of different ways here about the project. A quick little PowerPoint overview uh, to give you a sense of why we were doing this work, and then a tour of the Spotlight exhibit, and then a little bit of a closeout with some lessons learned. Uh, I am on a VPN to the Vatican so that we can see some of the back end stuff. So I fully expect all of this to collapse horribly at some point. Um, and we'll keep our fingers crossed that it doesn't. Uh, so first, a little bit of an introduction about what this project was and why we were doing it. Um, we started working with the Vatican in 2015 and they were presented with a, a bit of a challenge. They've got 80,000 medieval manuscripts that they're digitizing. Uh, and almost all of them are poorly cataloged or uncatalogued in some cases. And what that means is that they needed to find new ways of inviting users into these digitized objects. Uh, we were very lucky that they had strong curatorial engagement there. Uh, each one of their curators wanted to tell specific kinds of stories about their material. And we also had a, a strategic goal of combining IIIF and Spotlight in some new ways and, uh, and TEI got thrown into the mix just as an added challenge for everybody. Uh, so 2015, we started with this idea of trying to find a way to tell the story of about 300 of the 80,000 manuscripts that they have and combining a number of different technologies to do that. Uh, just a little bit about what the uh, Vatican Library is doing. Uh, in this project. First of all, they helped to define and test a number of workflows and exposed requirements along the way, uh, things that they wanted to do but couldn't be done uh, in the software as it existed in 2015. Uh, they are taking a lead in terms of socializing some of this work uh, in Europe, which has been extremely helpful for, for all of us, both on the AAAF side and I think on the Spotlight side as well. And they've got content. Um, they've got so much content, it, uh, it becomes a little bit overwhelming. Uh, just as a quick example, in the IIIF manuscript space, this is what the environment looked like in 2012 and 13. Uh, our largest IIIF repositories had a, a little over a thousand manuscripts. By this year, the Vatican and the Bayonet had dwarfed everybody else. Uh, so we had sort of an order of magnitude change. And then over the next three to five years, the Vatican is going to dwarf everybody again. So trying to find ways of using uh, existing software or tweaked software to tell the stories of these large numbers of manuscripts coming into an interoperable space is one of the challenges that we were facing. Um, as we sat down with the Vatican curators, we started thinking about a process for them to do their work. Uh, we identified that they needed a workbench to do some drafting, to create annotations, to work together in small groups. We imagined a curation stage that would sort of sit in between there where um, the project uh, lead, uh, Paolo Minoni at the Vatican Library, could oversee all of the different teams' work. And then finally a publishing stage where the work that they were doing became public. And as we began to identify software, Spotlight played a central role in that. So Spotlight became the publishing stage where they could tell stories, publish their annotations, build comparisons along the way. And on the workbench side, Mirador was the go-to because of its ability to uh, allow lightweight annotation <clears throat> in a IIIF space. We had some middleware that was sitting there, um, sort of the remnants of an older manuscript project that would have allowed a curation stage. Um, but as it turns out, that caused the developers a great deal of anxiety, and we cut out that middle step uh, altogether. So Jack Reed, who I'm sure many of you know, and Aaron Fahey, uh, who was formerly at Stanford, uh, worked together to simplify that architecture. So we had a bunch of standalone Mirador instances for the groups to work in. We had a Spotlight instance with unpublished um, exhibits sitting in it. And then Jack and Aaron came up with a, a little connector called Anatot that does um, CRUD uh, between the Mirador instances and the Spotlight database. So essentially Spotlight was serving as a repository for all of the AAAF, AAAF annotations being made uh, as it was happening. 
and one of the benefits was that of that was that they were being indexed into Spotlight at the same time that they were being created and updated. Uh, we ran into some troubles with deletions, but we can talk about that later if anybody is interested. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is take a look a little bit behind the scenes at some of the um, the workflows that the Vatican team was was dealing with. And the first thing that I'm going to do is pop out of this particular share, one second, and share my uh, browser. Let's see. Browser went, there we go. All right. So the first thing I'm gonna show you is one of the standalone instances of Mirador that the teams were working in. And they had IP restricted access to these smaller working groups. And we pre-populated Mirador with all of the manuscripts that a, a given group was gonna work with. And so they could go in and collaboratively work together on annotating um, these objects. So you can see that this team was focused both on the text throughout as well as some feature annotations. And one of the things that they were doing as they went along the way was tagging with a, a semi-standard um, vocabulary uh, the types of annotations they were creating, who was creating the annotations so that they could keep track of them. And then um, their vocabulary changed project to project, but this would be used later uh, for fasting on some of these annotations. We also did some work with image parsing uh, to create the, the boxes around each of the lines just to assist them uh, in terms of getting ready to do their transcriptions as they went. So this was the, the works, workspace um, area, completely independent of Spotlight, except that these annotations were being stored in the Spotlight database and were accessible to Spotlight almost immediately. So then if we look and see what they've done with their published uh, spotlight. There are a few things to point out just on this home page. Uh, the home page was uh, tweaked slightly as a, a custom um, portal for them. Uh, Gary Geisler added some things along the right hand side that were specific to this project. Uh, but other than that, it's, it's basic spotlight formatting um, with some um, just a few tweaks to support the Vatican Library's color schemes and things like that, and to drop in a footer with um, the project partners in it. So the first thing to point out is that there's a project overview, uh, which was managed by the, uh, the project lead. So just give an idea of what this project is all about. And I'm glossing over a lot of things that we covered. Uh, if you want to read more about how this project came to be and what it was all about, uh, this overview is a nice place to start. But I thought I might just take a quick tour of a few of these exhibits to point out some of the features that were added for this particular project. And the first one I'll take a look at, um, or the first two really, are the two paleography projects. And I'm going to drop into the Greek paleography project, uh, which was put together by Timothy Jantz, who is the, the curator for uh, Greek and, uh, and other materials in the Vatican Library. Uh, Timothy's goal was to create the first English language Greek paleography textbook, um, well, the first in the last 30 years, uh, but to do it as an electronic resource. So he's using Spotlight to essentially create a new um, a course book uh, for those interested in Greek paleography. And uh, as such, on his introductory page, it's very text heavy. But as soon as we move into his different chapters, we can start to see some of the things that were done in Spotlight specifically in the way he was using Spotlight to essentially build an interactive course book. Um, the first feature I wanted to point out was a Mirador widget, which you all might have seen before. Uh, this is a way for the curators to build comparative views that are consistent, uh, but still allow a user to um, interact with the material. So in this case, Timothy chose two different types, two different examples of a specific kind of script that he wanted to uh, show users. And then uh, because Mirador is there and interactive, it allows a user to continue to compare those scripts across different, different sections of the manuscripts that they appear in if you wanted to. And then of course, once you re refresh the page, that um, 
example returns to its normal normal place. All right. It's a little slow because I'm on the, the VPN to the Vatican, but you can see it just rebuilds um, the initial comparison that Timothy had set up. So that was one of the features that took the team a while to add in. And we're hoping that it will become a little bit more standard. Uh, if we take a look at the Latin classics exhibit, this team was using their exhibit space to tell the story of the transmission of Greek and Roman texts into the Middle Ages and into the early modern period. And so they're using a lot of the familiar widgets. Um, the uh, carousel, for instance, got a lot of, a lot of play in this particular exhibit. Um, but once again, they're also using uh, feature pages to tell a couple of stories. One thing I wanted to point out here, though, was their use of annotation tags. So in the workbench, I mentioned that they were tagging their annotations with a, a semi-controlled vocabulary. And you can see how that's then being indexed into Spotlight and used for navigation among the materials. So if we take a look quickly at all of the mentions of Aeneas in the Latin classics exhibit, we get a little thumbnail of the region of interest where Aeneas has been tagged or the page where he, he's been tagged. And then this is actually um, a search result on those annotations. And so if we jump, jump into one here, this should take us to an item view page for just that annotation. Mirador will take a second to build again. And then you can see that this annotation is in this context on the page. And because we're using Mirador 2, um, the annotation body appears superimposed on the image. It causes a little bit of trouble navigating, but you can see the full annotation by scrolling through. The full annotation text is also down at the bottom. There's a link into the full manuscript if a user wants to move from the annotation into a further exploration of the manuscript. Or you can uh, navigate through other tags that were uh, created along the way. So we've got Aeneas here, but if we wanted to then see other illustrations in blank space, that generates another search uh, result. And then you see the types of um, decorations that are being put into blank spaces in the, in the manuscripts. Uh, they also used browse categories pretty heavily in this one. Uh, so you can see again, if you want to just quickly move through the manuscripts that they're trying to tell the story of, uh, they've broken them up into a series of uh, hopefully very useful browse categories uh, for people interested in this topic. Uh, the next exhibit that I'd like to point to is a reconstruction of a Renaissance library that they did uh, around Federico de Montefeltro's books. Many of them wound up in the Vatican, but the library was scattered across a number of different libraries of this point. And so this is an introduction to Montefeltro's library, uh, hopefully gaining interest from other institutions that can contribute via IIIF to future iterations of this exhibit. So they've used annotation tags again, uh, but um, one of the things that we can look at here again is sort of the way that they've used their browse categories to just introduce a few manuscripts or to look at heraldry across the manuscripts. Uh, or in this case, they focused on some of the bindings from the Renaissance as well. Uh, so you can see some of the intact bindings uh, for the manuscripts listed here. And they made a number of different choices in terms of overall display, but basically using Spotlight to, again, sort of tell different kinds of stories about the manuscripts that they're, they're particularly interested in highlighting here. And then finally, I wanted to look at the Vatican Palimpsests manuscript. Uh, so Palimpsests are manuscripts where the original text has been scraped off and then the vellum has been reused, uh, which builds up layers of text over time that can be recovered through scientific imaging. Uh, and this one stretched our abilities just a little bit for um, sort of sensible display and, and viewing for these types of objects. Um, but there are two features in this one that I wanted to point out. One was uh, the way that they've used, um, sorry, I got the wrong one here. The way that they've used Mirador to show what scientific imaging can, 
do. So in this case, they've got the same folio under two different types of light um, to basically show how scientific imaging is allowing them to recover some of the undertext uh, that appears there. And this will get better over time, I believe, as layers of images in IIIF are better supported. Uh, but right now, they're just using a simple side-by-side -side comparison to allow a user to see the, difference, uh, the differences the different imaging techniques make. Uh, and then the other thing that I wanted to point out was um, the addition of what they called a curatorial narrative field for the item view page uh, within Spotlight. And so you've got your basic metadata coming in here, uh, being indexed in from the TEI uh, as a small set. There are more details if you want to get the full um, metadata context here. But then there's also a, a place for uh, the curator to add uh, a small overview, uh, something that's a little bit friendlier than structured metadata uh, and allows the curator in this particular exhibit to provide some information about this manuscript specific to this exhibit. Uh, since they are only using 300 manuscripts across the whole project, many of the manuscripts get reused and each curator wanted to say a little bit some, uh, something a little bit different about the book uh, in the context of their particular exhibit. So this gives the curator a chance to essentially personalize it for this particular exhibit. Okay, so that's just a quick overview. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing here and we'll share once again the PowerPoint. Slide. Okay. So just a quick note on all of these things. Um, we added that um, line recognition tool because of how long it takes to actually draw a box in Mirador. Uh, so it was much easier to pre-process this material, load all of the annotations into the Spotlight database, and then allow both the workbench and Spotlight to have access to them uh, so that the curators could just basically edit the boxes as they were given and then replace uh, dummy text with um, with their actual transcriptions. In this case, uh, fairly intense Greek transcription. But we also um, customized annotation borders. Uh, so we added some new features into um, Mirador to allow them to do that. We enabled right to left, left to right, and bi-directional annotation creation and viewing. Uh, we added image mirroring for the Palimpsest team. Uh, so that you could flip an image on its vertical axis. Uh, we built up the comparison widgets in Spotlight, basically a pre-configured Mirador uh, instance that could be dropped into uh, an exhibit uh, feature page wherever you wanted. Uh, there was a lot of custom indexing and display in Spotlight. So throwing TEI into the mix uh, caused a lot of, um, I, I would say, uh, a challenge for the indexing team uh, because they were basically indexing TEI as the primary metadata, indexing the IIIF annotations to layer alongside them, and then indexing the exhibit and annotation tags uh, for faceting as well. So it was a fairly complicated indexing task that I think looks good in the, the Vatican spotlight, uh, but was definitely high overhead and probably doesn't look as complicated as it was for the development team. And then finally, that ability to add curatorial summaries to the item views was something that came a little bit later, uh, but wound up being very helpful for them to tell their particular stories. Uh, as we've worked with the Vatican team, we've been looking forward a little bit for the things that they wish they had, but didn't quite have uh, on, in the current iteration of this project. Uh, so they wanted to be able to layer and filter annotations in a little bit more nuanced way um, instead of just the color and thickness of the bounding boxes, uh, which they were using to distinguish between different types of annotations. Uh, and they wanted a better display environment for the annotations instead of just overlaying on the Mirador image. Uh, they also wanted to decouple the published environment from the working environment a little bit. Uh, in the interest of sustainability, um, Jack and Aaron conflated the spotlight and Mirador instances uh, into something that was a little bit more controllable in the short term for the de developers. Uh, but the goal, I think, for next iteration of this project would be to have a more robust working environment that could then uh, sort of 
in a more controlled way be fed out to Spotlight for viewing. Um, and then finally, uh, they wanted the ability to compare within this exhibit uh, with non-Vatican manuscripts. So because there are so many relationships between their manuscripts and manuscripts around the world, they want to be able to pull in by IIIF content from other repositories a little bit more easily. In the short term, so that more robust workbench is definitely on the Vatican um, project horizons. Uh, and we would like to see if we could use machine learning and AI to do the parsing and feature recognition uh, a little bit better. And then also looking for better support for scientific imaging and other specialized imaging methods within the spotlight context itself. All right, so that is it. And I am more than happy to answer any questions you might have. And I would like to, to learn a little bit more about the Mirador widget, that comparison one. And when I first saw that, I thought, this is great. We need this here. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a little bit about how you put that together? Is that actually a widget? How does it show up in the edit mode? Uh, I'm not rambling on too much. No, no, that's great. So yeah, in edit mode, it shows up as a widget. Um, let me see if I can just sign in quickly and we'll, uh, we'll take a look at it. Oh, that's it perfect. Yeah. As I'm doing that, I'll just talk through. So Mirador can be configured on the back end to have uh, multiple windows open and populated with specific things. Uh, and so the widget basically just does that. Um, if we drop into one of these that has it set up. So a quick look behind the scenes shows that uh, the curator will choose two different uh, images from two different manuscripts uh, from this exhibit, much like other widgets look. And then uh, behind the scenes, you can preview and configure the viewer so that you can set a zoom level and set the specific page. So like, kind of like the gallery instance um, or the, the carousel instance, you can choose the material you want to look at, and then this takes you out to a, another uh, screen where you actually do the, do the um, sorry, do the actual configuration and setting the, the specifics for the, the comparison that you want to have. So does that answer your question, Mike? Yeah, yes, it does. That, that is neat. The way that widget shows up makes it very easy then for editors and uh, exhibit creators to manage and manipulate that. That's a nice touch. Is that uh, just in the uh, Vatican version of the Spotlight or is that in the Project Spot, uh, Spotlight repository then? Yeah, as far as I know, it's just in Vatican exhibits now. Okay. Um, but I think there is a strong desire to push it back up into Spotlight. One of the reasons that the team didn't do that right away is that this work also overlapped with the Mirador 3 work that, that's ongoing. And I think um, Jack and the team wanted to make sure that uh, Mirador 3 was going to be the basis of stuff that went into the, the core repository. Perfect. Okay. Uh, also, uh, Kathy, while you're on the line there too, and, and with Ben, we, ben, we are working on a, uh, a roadmap and, Kathy started this a while back about a community roadmap. Some of these things that you're pointing out would be very nice to have on that roadmap list so that people can see it um, because it, it really is an interesting widget. I, I like that I can make use of it here. Um, yeah, we're, we're hoping we can make use of it here as well. <laughs> Great. Great. Yep. The, some things are already on my list, such as this very <laughs> widget. So, um, <laughs> I wanted to just make a quick comment. First of all, Ben, I wanted to thank you. Um, I learned things that I didn't know. Um, and and the, the, the thing that really struck me was the beginning of your slide deck where you were showing those bar graphs of um, the, uh, the landscape of digitally available, you know, uh, medieval and other manuscripts Right, and then the growth, the the growth over time, and where the Vatican is, 
Um, that's, um, that's a powerful, that sends a powerful message or explanation because sometimes at Stanford, um, it, it can be hard to convince our teams that it matters that we're working on something in collaboration with someone else um, outside of our own institution, right? Right. And I think that that makes a really powerful point. So thank you for sharing that. Well, I certainly don't want to monopolize the questions, but I've got another one. Uh, for you. And I, I just put in the chat uh, window, I'm looking at the uh, project overview homepage. Mm -hmm. uh, and th this may be just standard spotlight, I don't know, but there's the, the title bar, or that bar across the top, which is really nice. And then toward the middle of the page, the, uh, the graphic with the text beside it. What are those, uh, or how did you build those constructs or that, those elements, if I'm making sense? You are. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen again so we're looking at the same thing. Right. Um, those are just uh, embedded image widgets. Okay. Uh, I think those are standard. Kathy, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but basically, the curators chose a, a detail of an image, loaded it up into uh, into the widget, and and off they went. Okay. Um, we can just take yeah, a if look. We look. If we look behind the scenes, I'm sure I can. Yeah, but that's a standard. That's a standard widget. That's a standard widget. Okay. Uh, very good. Just one that was uploaded. That uh, the the other one, the text on the side there, um, on the middle, I. That was an embedded widget with text then. That's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, and the one thing I didn't talk about, which we can talk about, is that all of the feature pages and annotations are uh, bilingual. Um, they needed both Italian and English for this, so uh, the team worked pretty hard on, on switching back and forth. Um, though I think Kathy and others had already set up the framework for this kind of translation. Is that right, Kathy? Um, that's correct. And as a matter of fact, we uh, published a English Chinese exhibit now over a year ago, and we just published an English French exhibit. And coming up uh, early in the new year, we'll have an English Spanish exhibit. So what's really great about that is that um, uh, that's in Spotlight Master right? Um, th those are languages we support, first of all, but um, for the first uh, institution or entity who is um, creating a bilingual uh, exhibit in one of the, using one of the languages that, that um, Spotlight supports, um, there's extra upfront uh, little bit of lifting, not too heavy, um, that, you, that you have to do, uh, you have to work with a language expert to um, populate uh, uh, some locale files um, and get those uploaded. And so, but but whoever the first institution is who does that work, then everybody else can benefit from it, which is really great. That's right. The one complication here was that the annotation tags coming in from IIIF had their own config file uh, for translations because they're sort of outside of the, the normal Spotlight universe. Um, so this is metadata coming in and it was provided with um, English and Italian versions that were then keyed to the, the, the language that you were in. Nice job, very nice job. Uh, and it is a great site. Cool, uh, yeah, we're, we hope that this will be something that the Vatican can encourage others around Europe to use Spotlight for. Hopefully that'll grow the community a little bit. And they are certainly welcome to join our Spotlight community call. <laughs> we will tell them that. Yeah, that's good. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. If, we need to, if we need to go over there and present or something like that. Just if you them. have to, you have to. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and stop recording now. Okay. So, thanks again, Ben. Perfect. Uh,